Iraq continues to flaunt its hostility toward America and to support terror. The Iraqi regime has plotted to develop anthrax and nerve gas and nuclear weapons for over a decade. This is a regime that has already used poison gas to murder thousands of its own citizens, leaving the bodies of mothers huddled over their dead children. This is a regime that agreed to international inspections, then kicked out the inspectors. This is a regime that has something to hide from the civilized world. Iraq was just one of the three axis of evil states named by then President George W. Bush in his speech to the nation that January night. Bush's catalog of Iraqi transgressions was far more detailed and extensive than that of Iran and North Korea, the other two states comprising this axis. In January of 2002, the United States had already achieved a significant victory over terrorism. Operation Enduring Freedom, begun on October 7, 2001, scored a quick and decisive defeat of the terrorist-sponsoring Taliban regime in Afghanistan. The Al-Qaeda terrorist organization, hosted by the Taliban and responsible for the attack of September 11, 2001, was decimated and on the run. Although the war in Afghanistan would continue until Al-Qaeda and their leaders were brought to justice, the President made it clear that the war on terror would not end with victory in Afghanistan or the death of Al-Qaeda. He was dedicated to defeating terrorism throughout the world, and Iraq was at the top of the list of states that the U.S. would bring to justice. It was just a matter of time until the Iraqi regime was engaged. The plan for that engagement may have been in the works long before the attacks on September 11, 2001. George W. Bush's first Secretary of the Treasury, a guy named Paul O'Neill, um, later gave extensive interviews with a journalist, Ron Susskind, who reported and even released some documents um, that suggested even at the very first National Security Council meeting of the uh, George W. Bush administration that the question of Iraq was on the table. In fact, the first sort of foreign policy adventure of the new uh, um, Bush administration was a bombing, a U.S. air bombing of Iraq, but shouldn't take that too out of context because the Clinton administration had spent much of the 1990s periodically bombing Iraq for alleged violations of the no-fly zone and other kinds of uh, grievances. So that, that you know, was just one, I mean, it, it showed that the problem of Iraq was ongoing. In fact, to sort of think about the context, uh, even as the United States and Great Britain were basically enforcing a no-fly zone within Iraq that was not a, na a UN Security Council mandate, it was basically created by the uh, uh, US and uh, Great Britain that uh, the French and the Russians were spending a good portion of that decade arguing that um, the sanctions regime is bad policy. Hundreds of thousands of innocents within Iraq, children many of them, are suffering as a consequence of the sanction regime. So we need to end this and think of a new way to address Iraq. And so you had kind of a weird set of uh, circumstances coming together when the Bush administration came in because you had some hardliners that thought on to Baghdad should have been policy before before and certainly would be policy the next time, and you had the world that still thought about Iraq, you know, as as this um, long-term problem that uh, the the policy isn't necessarily working. The Iraq of President Saddam Hussein was the model of a rogue nation, an outlaw state that attacked its neighbors and governed its people by terror. It had fought an eight-year war with Iran in the 1980s which ended inconclusively after millions of deaths on both sides. It had invaded and occupied Kuwait in 1990, only to be ejected in 1991 by a U.S.-led coalition of nations. Although this defeat was humiliatingly decisive and extremely costly, Saddam Hussein continued to defy the international community by terrorizing his citizenry, and imposing an image of power in the region by creating a perception that Iraq was developing weapons of mass destruction.
you probably know about the project for a new American century, right? There were a number of people that became prominent in the administration who formed basically a think tank to uh, make some planning for the possibility of a new Republican administration, you know, starting in the late 1990s. But they were even active during the Clinton administration. So they had uh, written a letter to uh, President Clinton in support of a policy that the Congress ended up passing and the Clinton administration ended up signing, which was basically that U.S. policy called for regime change in Iraq. Now, it's not at all clear the Clinton administration essentially had any interest in pursuing this very actively. I mean, there were some monies appropriated by the Republican-controlled Congress that went, that supported some Iraqi groups around the world, uh, some of them dissidents, you know, to try to think about what ways you might have to uh, topple Saddam sort of non-violently. But there were certainly elements within a project for a new American century that thought, aha, this is, you know, the Democrats agreeing with us that Saddam Hussein has to go. The terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center in New York and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. on September 11th galvanized the Bush administration and gave America the justification it needed to invade Iraq and settle unfinished business there. After the September 11th, uh, 2001 attacks, um, there was some serious thinking in Washington about, you know, what should the U.S. do sort of after Afghanistan about these lingering problems of terrorism and uh, the potential that terrorism uh, might uh, be something much bigger than the problem of dog bites or uh, um, bathtub falls, right? That the, that the scale perhaps had changed. And the, the way that terrorism becomes a game-changing event is probably if it's linked to nation states that can provide it resources, financial support, technological support, et cetera. And if particular, if those states, um, often at that time and through the 90s, called rogue states, you know, sort of outlaw states, that if they were pursuing weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and worst possible of all, nuclear weapons. So if, the, if there was a nexus between these things, states that sponsor terrorism and states that are developing weapons of mass destruction, what happens if those, thing, those things all come together and they decide to build these weapons and give them the, to the terrorists to use to basically advance their foreign policy without having to suffer necessarily the direct blame for that policy. And so that's what I think became the central idea driving what became the Bush Doctrine, which was the idea that the U.S. might preventively use force, although the language was usually preemptively because for international law purposes, preemption has long been seen as legal while prevention is much more dubious, but it essentially was a preventive policy to prevent these things long before they happen because by the time there's a smoking gun or worse a mushroom cloud then it's too late right so you have to you, you you can't predict the activity of terrorists in the same way that you can predict hopefully the activity of nation states nation states have territory and peoples and they can be deterred hopefully and that's long been the idea of US foreign policy you know vis-a-vis -vis different kinds of threats i mean that was central to containment which was not only a policy used during the cold war to stop Soviet expansionism, but which was actually a policy, a dual containment of Iran and Iraq during the 1990s. So containment is a you know, flexible policy that can try to you know, prevent bad things from happening. But how do you prevent terrorists when you don't even know where they are? They're, they're intentionally trying to disguise themselves. So uh, um, when you have that particular motive, trying to stop that particular strain of what George W. Bush called evil, if you have to try to constrain that form of evil in, in that particular guise, then that was the justification for the Bush Doctrine, which could be targeted against their state sponsors. The Bush Doctrine was the idea that um, to enhance or to ensure American national security, we might need to take preemptive action in certain cases. In other words, if a country uh, is getting to the point where it is threatening uh, enough to our security that we are not simply going to wait for an attack uh, and then respond to it, but that we might move in preemptively uh, and uh, eliminate the threat to us. And that was articulated by Condoleezza Rice, who was National Security Advisor at that time. And um, it 
really it upset a lot of people, but I'd suggest great powers do that in any event. It may not be smart to go ahead and announce it, just as I don't think it was terribly smart of the president to talk about an axis of evil. Uh, things like that don't get you very far. Um, but great powers would tend to reserve that right of preemptive strike to themselves in any case. I'm not sure, though, that you need to advertise it. Since 1991, sanctions imposed on Iraq without consequences proved to be an ineffective deterrent. Saddam continued to flaunt his disdain for a series of UN resolutions. Even bombing of military centers for violations of the no-fly zone did not phase Saddam. The Bush administration wanted a more permanent solution. After September 11th, um, there was some serious thinking in Washington about how to think about this problem because I think the way that George W. Bush, Bush put it in a speech that he gave on September 20th, 2001 is, you know, the United States didn't want to send multi-million dollar missiles into a $20 tent, right? I mean, it was not, it was not the kind of exchange that was going to pay off because, uh, I mean, he didn't say it, but if you send that kind of missile into a tent, you might be creating more angry people and more terrorists, right? So it, the, the thing was to think strategically about what this problem was. And so the, the real huge concern about terrorism was that it was transformed into something that might kill thousands or worse, hundreds of thousands or millions of people rather than on the scale of dog bites or bathtub falls. And if that was going to happen, it was likely going to require state sponsorship and especially the kind of rogue states that were pursuing weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, nuclear weapons. And so those states quickly became the ones under the microscope. And they had already been an important part of American foreign policy throughout the 1990s. This concern about weapons of mass destruction was nothing new. Because if you look at those states, it's Iran, Iraq, North Korea, Libya. Um, you know, Libya was uh, uh, sort of an ambiguous position. It had been a much bigger concern back in the early Reagan years in the 80s we talked about before. It wasn't uh, in the same kind of situation. North Korea's ties to terrorism were, you know, some old uh, former terrorists from the 70s that it hit, had hijacked planes and, you know, taken Japanese prisoners and things like that. So they, it wasn't really the same kind of terrorism. And so, uh, you know, Iraq quickly rose to the top of that list. Um, you know, the, even the axis of evil that George W. Bush identified, you know, it was clear that uh, Iraq was a, a central part of that. And the great fear was that, um, these states might work with terrorist networks so that without attribution for the state's foreign policy, in other words, they'd be blameless, these terrorists might pursue, you know, nefarious agendas that would be very much anti-Western and would be part of uh, um, these threats to the United States that it did not want to see occur. So, you know, the, the reason why Iraq became so important in any potential countries that were pursuing weapons of mass destruction and state sponsorship of terrorism was because of that, that nexus. The question soon became how to get the American people to go along with this change of direction in the war on terror. The issue of Iraq's disarmament reached a crisis in the fall of 2002 when President Bush demanded a complete end to alleged Iraqi production of weapons of mass destruction and full compliance with UN Security Council Resolutions 1441, requiring UN weapons inspectors unfettered access to suspected weapons production facilities. The UN had prohibited Iraq from developing or possessing such weapons after the Gulf War and required Iraq to permit inspections confirming compliance. Bush repeatedly warned of military action unless inspections were allowed to progress. Iraq reluctantly agreed to new inspections in November of 2002. The weapons inspectors did not uncover any weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Shortly before the invasion, Hans Blix, the lead weapons inspector, advised the UN Security Council that Iraq was cooperating with inspections and that the confirmation of disarmament through inspections could be achieved in a short period of time if Iraq remained cooperative. 
But the Bush administration thought that was not enough. The Bush administration had signaled throughout 2002 that Iraq was increasingly under the microscope. In January, in the State of the Union address, President Bush mentioned the, uh, the um, axis of evil and identified Iraq. And through that year, there was trickling of things. Some of the European governments were grumbling about it or whatever. Uh, in August of 2002, um, Dick Cheney gave a speech for the veterans of foreign wars where he made some very major claims about the potential threat from Iraq, both in terms of sponsoring of terrorism and developing weapons of mass destruction. Claims that for the most part have now been proven decisively wrong. <laughs> but at the time, they helped set the tenor for this discussion. Not wanting to act alone, the U.S. took its case to the United Nations. Basically, the Bush administration announced in a series of moves in September and October that they wanted the U.S. Congress and the United Nations to take seriously this threat from Saddam, that they were, they were considering a grave and gathering threat that needed urgent action. And so as a member of the United Nations Security Council, the U.S. basically brought this group together and said, you know, let's fix this lingering problem. You know, I mentioned already that, uh, that coming into the Bush presidency, um, France and Russia had been arguing to lift the sanctions or develop smart sanctions. You know, there were different ways of thinking about Iraq. But uh, by the fall, you know, the focus was on we need coercive leverage to prevent the kinds of cat and mouse games that he had been playing during the 1990s with the Clinton administration. So we need to, we need to find out decisively if there are any of these uh, weapons of mass destruction programs still underway, if they're hidden or whatever. Um, basically, the inspections regime had ended in 1998 when um, the Clinton administration basically had warned the United Nations that we're going to bomb and so you better get out. And then after that, they were never put back in. So there were several years there where essentially there was no new intelligence coming in about the status of those programs. The CIA had contacted Iraq's foreign minister, Naji Sabri, who was being paid by the French as an agent. Sabri informed them that Saddam had hidden poison gas among Sunni tribesmen, had ambitions for a nuclear program, but that it was not active and that no biological weapons were being produced or stockpiled, although research was underway. According to Sidney Blumenthal, George Tennant briefed Bush on September 18, 2002, that Sabri had informed them that Iraq did not have weapons of mass destruction. Bush dismissed this top secret intelligence from Hussein's inner circle, which had been approved by two senior CIA officers. The information was never shared with Congress or CIA agents examining whether Saddam had such weapons. In October 2002, the U.S. Congress passed a joint resolution to authorize the use of United States armed forces against Iraq, a vote many in Congress would soon regret. The resolution authorized the president to use any means necessary against Iraq, but would the American people support direct military action in Iraq? Americans polled in January 2003 widely favored further diplomacy over an invasion. Later that year, however, Americans began to agree with Bush's plan. The U.S. government engaged in an elaborate domestic public relations campaign to market the war to its citizens. Americans overwhelmingly believed Hussein did have weapons of mass destruction. 85% said so, even though the inspectors had not uncovered any of those weapons. By February 2003, 74% of Americans supported taking military action to remove Hussein from power. The, the capacity to develop these weapons really wasn't so much in question. It was whether or not they had the facilities and the technology to do it and whether they were, whether they were actually doing it. 
And, and so the inspectors, after this reporting, then started to go into Iraq to make sure that they were in compliance with these agreements that they were coerced into making a decade before about essentially eliminating these programs. And uh, the UN investigated many of the, com the, the claims that were flying around, some of them that had been generated, for instance, in that report that the intelligence community in the US put together for the Congress. And so they investigated these high power magnets, they investigated these aluminum tubes that were of particular length, all things that were claimed by the sort of uh, war hawks, if you will, um, that uh, were instrumental to an Iraqi weapons of mass destruction program. But the inspectors on the ground basically found almost nothing. There were, there were many things that basically the UN weapons inspectors decisively demonstrated, um, but the attitude in the Bush administration was, well, the weapons inspectors had been wrong about Iraq before, so we are not going to listen to them this time. And so even though it turned out the weapons inspectors were basically able to find out lots of information and were able to determine, not ultimately conclusively, but they were making clear progress that they couldn't find anything, because now we know it turned out there was nothing to find, but uh, you know that was all basically brushed aside eventually when the decision was made to go to war. On February 5, 2003, Secretary of State Colin Powell presented further evidence in his Iraqi WMD program presentation to the UN Security Council that unmanned aerial vehicles were ready to be launched against the east coast of the United States. At the time, there was a vigorous dispute within the U.S. military and intelligence communities as to whether CIA conclusions about Iraqi UAVs were accurate. Other intelligence agencies suggested that Iraq did not possess any offensive UAV capability, saying the few they had were designed for surveillance and intended for reconnaissance. A meeting between George W. Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair took place on January 31, 2003, in the White House. A secret memo of this meeting purportedly showed that the Bush administration had already decided on the invasion of Iraq at that point. Bush was allegedly floating the idea of painting a U-2 spy plane in UN colors and letting it fly low over Iraq to provoke Iraqi forces into shooting it down thereby providing a pretext for the U.S. and Britain to invade. Bush and Blair made a secret deal to carry out the invasion regardless of whether WMD were discovered by U.N. weapons inspectors, in direct contradiction with statements Blair made to the British House of Commons afterwards that the Iraqi regime would be given a final chance to disarm. In the memo, Bush is paraphrased as saying, the start date for the military campaign was now penciled in for 10 March. This was when the bombing would begin. Bush said to Blair that he thought it unlikely that there would be internecine warfare between the different religious and ethnic groups in Iraq after the war. War was about to come again to the land between the rivers. In his 2002 State of the Union speech, President George W. Bush declared worldwide war on terrorism and terrorist states. While most of the country and many political leaders were focused on retribution for the 9-11 attacks, the Bush administration believed they saw the larger picture and the likelihood of more attacks if the United States remained passive regarding the states that sponsored the terrorists. Thousands of dangerous killers, schooled in the methods of murder, often supported by outlaw regimes, are, not, are now spread throughout the world like ticking time bombs set to go off without warning. Operation Enduring Freedom was the first campaign in the war on terror, and Operation Iraqi Freedom would be the second. From everything I've seen, 
there were people, and Rumsfeld was one, uh, and I think President Bush, the second Bush, was himself convinced that there was some linkage here between Al-Qaeda uh, and Saddam Hussein. It was you know, a strained link at best. I think most uh, analysts say there wasn't really anything there. Um, but apparently there were some members of the administration who were determined that they wanted to you know, finish the job uh, in Iraq and that there, there must be some connection um, between the two even if there wasn't. Um, seems similar to the, the reasoning about the weapons of mass destruction that if he was hiding something that must be what he was hiding so therefore there must be weapons of mass destruction which there weren't. In recent days some governments in the Middle East have been doing their part they have delivered public and private messages urging the dictator to leave Iraq so that disarmament can proceed peacefully. He has thus far refused. All the decades of deceit and cruelty have now reached an end. Saddam Hussein and his sons must leave Iraq within 48 hours. Their refusal to do so will result in military conflict commenced at a time of our choosing. On orders from the Commander-in-Chief, soldiers and Marines around the world saddled up in response to the call to arms. I believe it was Martin Luther King uh, weekend. I was in San Diego visiting a friend and I got recalled and we were supposed to have Monday off. Um, it was Martin Luther King or President's Day, I, I can't remember the, the exact weekend. I got recalled um, to come back to the office for a meeting. So um, that morning I got up early out of San Diego and might have gotten a speeding ticket that day, I don't really remember, and uh, drove back to Yuma and went to a meeting and that was the time when they said, this is happening, we're getting the call, we're going to go, it's, we're deploying to Kuwait uh, for a potential fall into Iraq. Um, you, Eddie, that is my nickname uh, throughout the Marine Corps, um, Eddie, you're going to go on the advance party, you leave on Thursday. We wanted to go. Uh, we wanted to go defend our country. We wanted to go meet the enemy. Um, but I don't ever remember, uh, I don't remember the exact phone call or the exact time when it was said, hey, Logan, pack your trash, be here at this time, be ready to report, be ready to go defend your country. And we got, I had several phone calls of what's your count, who have you talked to? And I would get one of those every two or three hours. Uh, and then I would get other phone calls that were, hey, we haven't heard anything, we're waiting on the word, the proverbial word. But I never got a phone call until um, probably January 2003, um, the activation orders are in hand. And, and you are getting activated, you are, you are moving forward. And that was for the invasion of Iraq. It was always a feeling of it's not when it, or if, it's not an if we're going to go. It's always, it was all a when we're going, when are we going. It wasn't an if. So there was, I think really after the September 11th attacks, there wasn't any question uh, that it was going to happen, just when it was going to happen. And I think almost, uh, I got the call, I was uh, laying next to my girlfriend, I think on a you know, Sunday morning, first sergeant finally called and said, hey, we got orders, you know, start your phone tree or whatever. For most of the Marines, the call was a welcoming one. And that's, it was almost a, re a relief because for those two years, it's been like, you know, we go, we train, and I'm, I'm gonna do my civilian job and still go train. I'm, so I'm still do, I still have to do this, but this war is coming. So it, it's, it was attention. You're always on edge, you're always preparing. You didn't know. So almost that call came as a relief. It's like, oh, I can now focus on one thing, being a Marine, preparing for war, uh, let's go. Um, and, and so that was kind of the initial feeling, but then um, for this first deployment, it was total unknown. You know, we were going to war, you know, all we'd seen was the full metal jackets, um, your platoon, your movies on TV, you know, nobody, nobody knew how to act. We had some Desert Storm veterans, but that was a three-day war, you know. Uh, nobody in our units were from Vietnam anymore, you know, nobody in the Marine Corps, uh, you know, had a combat action ribbon, and you know, for the most part, till uh, till this kicked off. So it was it was totally unknown. And
in the meantime, I had some of my the rest of my company um, going in to do some of the offload of the equipment that uh, some of the the preposition ships that we have out. They were going to offload that equipment in Kuwait. Our unit didn't have because we were so late on the docket, so to speak, to deploy. We were embarking all our gear, but it wasn't going to make it in time because I had this, you know, slow boat to China kind of thing. Um, so once we got over there, we were going to be sharing gear with other units. Not sharing, but all the units would have to go back to the the stubby pencil drill and see. No kidding, what gear do I need? What gear can I live without? How do I spread load this gear among five units, vice four, or whatever the number was? So uh, it was getting ready to get really exciting and and scary in many ways. Not, you know nail biting scary but just like holy crap this is this is it now we're doing what we've been trained to do and oh yeah we got a lot of training to do because I'm not really sure what we're gonna do. It was totally unknown and we you know we we based all of our actions and thoughts or we had our training but it was also that was also formed by Hollywood nobody really knew what to expect but you know we were excited we were ready to go and really um, I think we all felt fortunate to um, do our mission because there's plenty of Marines before us who Trained, 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 20 years, retired, no combat experience. And here we were, we finally get to do what we trained for. The U.S. Armed Forces were heading back to Iraq to take care of some unfinished business. American military strategists knew that Saddam's power was rooted in Baghdad, so they planned for a swift, penetrating invasion that would quickly bring Allied forces to the gates of Baghdad. Most of the planners thought that the real fight would be for the capital, and that the thrust to Baghdad and passage across Iraq's southern wasteland would be relatively free from attack. So the U.S. Army's V Corps was ordered to race northwest through the Iraqi desert, with the 3rd Infantry Division in the lead. The United States Marines were commanded to charge up the middle to hold Iraqi units in place. The Marines would send their 1st Marine Expeditionary Force. The 1st MEF was a small corps, including the 1st Marine Division, the British 1st Armored Division, 2nd Marine Expeditionary Brigade, the 3rd Marine Air Wing, MAW, and all supporting logistical units. The three reinforced regimental combat teams of the 1st Marine Division would lead the Marine charge to Baghdad, while the British 1st Armored Division secured Basra. The 2nd Marine Expeditionary Brigade was given the mission of keeping the supply route clear behind the 1st Marine Division's attack. At 0534 local time in Baghdad on March 20th, 2003, U.S. and United Kingdom forces began operations against Iraq. The initial strikes consisted of 40 cruise missiles and strikes led by two F-117s from the 8th Fighter Squadron, supported by Navy EA-6B Prowlers and other aircraft. These attacks came shortly after the expiration of the 48-hour deadline President Bush had given Iraqi President Saddam Hussein to leave Iraq. This attack was aimed directly at Saddam and signaled a major change in U.S. policy in the conduct of war. The long-standing prescription against assassination of enemy political leaders was officially ended by this initial strike. Although the strike failed to kill Saddam, it was significant for more than the policy change. The fact that intelligence considered to be reliable had provided the targeting information also signaled a highly different way of waging war. Allied Special Forces had infiltrated Iraq long before the start of hostilities and had mapped the most important targets for targeting planners. These included leadership, command and control, and military targets. They continued to provide targeting information throughout the aerial campaign, including a second direct attempt at Saddam. <laughs> 
These forces were highly active in northern Iraq, where they worked with Kurdish forces to defeat the Iraqi army. They also paved the way for the insertion, via airdrop, of the 173rd Airborne Brigade. During Desert Storm, roughly 10% of the munitions used were precision-guided munitions, or smart bombs. During Operation Iraqi Freedom, that number went up to 80%, and the bombs were even smarter. Air power led the ground attack in Operation Desert Storm in 1991 and was used more extensively in support of the ground war in Operation Iraqi Freedom. This was primarily because the 2003 ground war began on day one of overall operations in hopes of catching the Iraqi military by surprise. The beginning of the war also caught some of the Marines at Camp Coyote off guard. From Camp Coyote, we were sent to um, set up checkpoints, um, heading into Breach Point West, which, you know, if, if I had a map in front of me, I could show you where it is, but as far as um, picking it out and saying, oh, it was at this grid corner or whatever, but we were set up, uh, the Marines from, realistically, the platoon I was, I was with, um, set up checkpoints heading into Breach Point West going up, uh, uh, I guess it was the, the main road into Iraq from Kuwait City and out into the desert. Um, and I want to say we started uh, that mission around the 17th or 18th of March. And uh, we set that up and there was, at the end of the checkpoints, we had five checkpoints set up basically on the, on the corners, on the turns, where the Marines were supposed to turn to get to this uh, assembly area so they could breach and, and invade Iraq. When we got out there, it was a vast expanse of nothing. Um, and I spent several hours, better part of a day, traveling between the posts, checking on Marines, making sure that they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, which it was a pretty simple mission. Keep your eyes out. Um, if somebody comes up and asks directions, to push in this direction. Um, look for dumb stuff to happen. Stay awake. You know, just the, it was a very simple mission. But by the time I got back to Breach Point West at Checkpoint 5, it, it was really, it was really, it left me in awe to look at the amount of rolling stock that the U.S. military had, and that was just a small portion of what was at the disposal of the U.S. military, not just, not just the Marine Corps, but there was Marines and soldiers there as well. And you just sit there and go, where did all these vehicles come from? Where did all the tanks and the Humvees? And it was, it was a, a sight to behold, really, just because of everything that was there. While Logan was back at Camp Coyote, the real shooting war began. We were sitting there at Camp Coyote and um, cleaning weapons, knowing that the invasion is either about to start or had started. And I was sitting there with um, Staff Sergeant Ryan Lattermilk, who was our platoon commander at the time. And we heard something go overhead. We both thought it was an A-10 Warthog, just by the sound. And uh, he looked at me and said, that's what I'm talking about. I said, you think that was a warthog? And then he stopped and, and kind of looked at me funny. And about that time, a siren sounded. Well, it was a scud. Um, and we all broke, all broke out, hopped in these bonkers. And they had this most annoying voice I've ever heard that would, uh, would get on the, there was a PA system there at Coyote, and they would get on there and go, bunker, bunker, bunker. It was this female's voice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Get scuds, get intercepted overhead. I remember one time we were, we were you know, in an encampment. This is actually after we, we jumped over the berm. Uh, we started taking mortars, so we got up and moved. Uh, as soon as we moved, a scud got intercepted overhead, and I can remember seeing it was just this bright orange glow all, as far as you could see, everywhere. And, um, which was odd because the smoke was so thick. You know, it got so thick at one point that the night vision goggles, we had, uh, you know, generation two, I think, you know, MVG fives that you couldn't see, even with night vision goggles, you couldn't see your hand. But anyway, this scud gets intercepted, and somebody starts a rumor way down over here in the grunts that you know gas. So by the time it gets to me, it's this huge ah! 
you know, gas, gas, gas. People are putting on their masks. You know, people are jumping into daggum, you know, uh, uh, slit trenches filled with shit. You know, everybody's, some guy can't find his mask, so he beats up his buddy and takes his. That caused some, some odd, you know, conversations later. But, uh, you know, it's just mass panic, pandemonium, until finally some NCOs, you know, kind of grab control of some things and start getting people to do things. But, you know, it was, it was real intense. People were really geared up. And it was so irritating. It was just like, hey, just get a wailing siren or something. We don't need that. Whatever that is, we don't need that. Just So we went, hopped in the bunkers, and then you'd wait. And then 10 minutes later, they'd tell you, gas, gas, gas. So you'd have to put on your gas mask and get all suited up and all that Mickey Mouse crap. And then 10 or 15, 20 minutes later, they'd say, all clear. So you'd go back to whatever it was you were doing. The next day, what they would be doing was to breach Iraqi defenses and begin the charge to Baghdad. 